Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Brothers, sisters, friends, assalamu alaikum. Welcome. It gives me tremendous pleasure to be in New Zealand and to share my story with so many of you tonight. Now I can see a lot of non-Muslims in the room. Just relax, I'm not Islam's answer to Billy Graham. Um, I want to share this story with you so you can enjoy it, maybe understand a little bit more about Islam. The title of the story is From Kabul to Kaaba, but I want to take you back a few weeks before I entered Kabul. I want to take you back to September 11. I bet everyone in this room can remember exactly where they were, who they were with, what they were doing when they heard about September 11. The Muslims that I have spoken to who saw the horrific events unfold on television told me that at the moment of the second plane going into the Twin Towers and realizing it was a terrorist strike, their first reaction was, please God, don't let this be the work of Muslims. I was in my newsroom in Fleet Street in London when I noticed people gathering around the television sets that were there. And I shouted over to somebody at the Sunday Express and said, what's going on? And they said, oh, there's been a terrible accident. There's a plane crashed into one of the Twin Towers in New York. And there's something compelling, isn't there, about live news breaking and live pictures. And I went up and joined everybody else and watched the drama unfold. And then we saw the second plane going in. I've told you about the immediate reaction of Muslims. My immediate reaction was, this is a big, big story. It's bigger than the assassination of JFK, could even be bigger than man landing on the moon. I've got to get out to New York. My reaction was different to those of the Muslims, certainly. By the time I got to Heathrow Airport, the Twin Towers had imploded, the Pentagon had been hit, a plane had gone down in Pennsylvania, America was at war, it was under siege. Her airspace had been closed down, her borders had been sealed, and I physically couldn't get into the country, no matter which airline or which route I looked at, it was impossible. And so I hung round Heathrow in and out for the next four days. Finally, 
I got that ticket for the first flight out to New York. And as I was making my way to the departure lounge, my phone went and it was my boss, the news editor. He said, there's been a change of plans. We want you to go to Pakistan. I was furious. The contacts that I had been making were in New York. My clothes that I had packed were for New York. I'd never been to Pakistan. I probably needed injections. You know, what is this country? Why do you want to send me there? This is a Middle Eastern thing. Why don't I go to the Middle East? And he said, no, the story is going to unfold in, in Pakistan, in neighboring Afghanistan. Within 12 hours, I arrived in Islamabad, dressed for New York, which went down very well, as you can imagine. And over the next few days, I started writing about people's hopes and fears for the impending war which was going to happen in neighboring Afghanistan, where the richest country in the world was going to bomb the poorest country in the world. By the end of the week, 3,000 journalists from around the world had joined me. They were in Peshawar, they were in Islamabad, and they were down in Quetta. Thousands of journalists from all over the world, from print, radio, TV, the internet, every form of communication you can imagine. I worked for a Sunday newspaper. I was the chief reporter of the Sunday Express, and I was trying to second guess what the news would be at the weekend, you get a chance to be more analytical. And I'm not a journalist who has ever been spoon-fed from governments. I don't trust them. And so I began to think that the best story was probably in Afghanistan. From the ordinary people, the ordinary Afghan people, I wanted to know what their expectations and fears were, what life was like, for them, living under the Taliban, we'd read a lot of news. According to Bush and Blair, the Taliban was the most evil, brutal regime in the world. They subjugated and oppressed women. They killed them randomly. The tales that were coming out were terrible. I distinctly remember Tony Blair saying, these people are so evil they won't even let their children fly kites. And so I decided, well, I need to find this out for myself. And I went to the Taliban embassy in Islamabad, and I tried three times to get a visa, and three times I was rejected. And so in the end, with my guides, I had got two or three guides who were helping me. I decided to sneak into Afghanistan. The idea was planted in my head by the BBC's chief correspondent, John Simpson, who had put on a burqa and put his toe into Afghanistan and said, hey, look, I've become invisible. And I thought, well, if the BBC's gargantuan correspondent can become invisible, then surely it will be easy for me. And so we devised a plan that we would be part of a wedding party. I would go in with two guides, one from the NWFP province in uh, Pakistan. The other one was born in Afghanistan. And we went in as a group. I put on the burqa, we drove through the Khyber Pass. That was another eye-opening experience. I imagined the Khyber Pass to be about 30 yards long. It was 33 miles long, winding dramatic mountainous roads, amazing scenery, traces of British imperialism everywhere. And then we went right down into a dust bowl known as Torkham and there was no man's land.